and welcome to another exciting episode of Hollywood Blockbusters. I am your host, Joe Hollywood. And once again, I am joined by Imaginos Pete. Hey, hey. And also Finding Andrew Walker. Yes. Oh, well <laughs> Finding done. Finding Andrew Walker. <laughs> Andrew now, Lightyear. That should be the third part of a trilogy that uh, needs to be completed because <laughs> Pixar did two Finding movies. We need a third one. Finding Joe. Andrew. Being yeah. Johnny on the spot. He's lost that. somewhere down in Hamtramck. You know, I'd like to point <laughs> something out. Andrew cleaned himself up. I thought I was being professional getting a little beard trim here because I was starting to look a little bit like Kaczynski, but look at Andrew. Andrew went the full <laughs> nine on yeah. I know. Whenever I let my, my beard grow out, I, I think I look like, you know, a Chippendale dancer or something, and then I realize I, I look like. Like you said, the Unabomber. I was I was in trouble when the Detroit Zoo was doing double takes and looking at me. I'm like, no, fellas, I'm not, I'm not missing from the enclosure. Just I better go get it. Why are those guys following me with a net? Yeah. All right. So today's theme is uh, Disney and Pixar. Uh, they have uh, a release schedule for 2024 uh, that's pretty interesting, and most of them uh, are either prequels or sequels. But uh, apparently Disney has gotten in the habit of re-releasing some of their previous movies back into theaters. And I don't know if that helps pad their grosses or, or what they're trying to do. But um, this past weekend, uh, just before this podcast, they re-released Luca, which was originally released in 2021. Have either one of you seen Luca? No, I have not got a chance. It was not on my radar, and I found out that it, despite the fact that it was released back in theaters, it's still on Disney+. Plus. So I sat down to watch it just to get familiar with it, and probably about 15 minutes into it, I turned it off. And Luca is just another uh, Pixar movie in a string of Pixar movies that have been released over the past couple of years that I just don't get. I don't understand. I don't like them. (laughs) And I'm not sure what's happening with Pixar. Uh, There's, there's a few movies that I I was excited about, went to go see in theaters and almost walked out. Um, One example is uh, what's the one, well, inside out, that's the one about like emotions and stuff, right? Yeah. And they have a sequel to that coming out in, on June 14th, Inside Out 2, where Riley uh, continues to navigate her confusing new emotions as she enters her teenage years. And there's been some interesting discussions about that particular movie. Um, some uh, conservatives, I guess you might say, after seeing a sneak preview of that particular movie, think that Riley might be a lesbian. And they're up in arms about that. And I'm like, you're you're coming away with it from the trailer? Okay. Wow. Um, but I you know, I saw the first Inside Out, and even though overall I liked it, I thought it was one of the most depressing movies that Pixar had ever put out. And it Riley doesn't get redeemed, I guess for lack of a better word, until like the last five minutes of the movie. And most movies kind of have this structure. There's first act, second act, third act. The second act is always the dark act where there's conflict and bickering and arguing. Sure. And I remember as I watched uh, Inside Out, that second act came, and I'm like, oh, here's here's the dark middle act. And it kept going and going and going. And I'm like, this movie's going to end soon. When are they going to resolve this? And it was within the last few minutes of the movie that it finally get resolved. I'm like, that was a long middle act. So even though overall I enjoyed it, that was yet another movie in a string of Pixar movies that I, I just didn't really feel like it was for me. Um, what was the other movie? Uh, Soul. Did you see Soul? Yeah. Yes, I am. Andrew, you see Soul? Nope. That's another one where I enjoyed certain aspects of it, but some of it was just way out there, like really artsy. And when they were dealing with a person's soul, I guess, and a person's spirit, they did some really wild, wacky things. And I, I preferred the parts of the movie that were grounded in reality that were on planet Earth. And then when they started getting into the artsy soul uh, realm, I'm like, I don't know what's going on here. And so I feel like over the past few years, Pixar has really gotten 
experimental and kind of out there, and I don't necessarily feel like those movies speak to me. Um, other movies that are coming out this year, Moana 2. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily the live action version. I guess that's in pre-production with yeah, the rock playing, uh, what's his name? Uh, what's his name? Returns as Maui. Yeah. So, so he's going to play Maui in a live action version of Moana, but on November 27th, they're, they're going to do a animated sequel Moana two, uh, where Moana continues her spiritual journey of self-discovery as she braves the high seas and takes on dangerous missions in Oceana. Uh, Dwayne will be back to the voice that, and uh, Alan Tudyk is going to uh, introduce a new character, uh, Hi Hi or Hey Hey or something like that. Uh, what were your thoughts of Moana when you saw Moana? I enjoyed it. I didn't really have the same reaction as I did with the early Toy Stories. I mean, with the Toy Story, the early <laughs> Pixar movies. I will say this, regarding the uh, inside out that you mentioned. My perspective is that Riley was not the main character. It was actually happy, uh, joy, and, and uh, sorrow. Yeah. And their story, and then there it's reflected their their uh, bond and their their understanding that they need each other to form. Like their memories have to kind of commingle for Riley to be at at peace. Yeah. To, I think that's why maybe it took that turn because the main characters are those two rather than Riley. It's just their actions are reflected in Riley and how she turns out. That's why it felt like, I, I kind of agreed. I was like, well, Riley finally came together in the last five minutes, but that's because yeah. it took joy and sorrow to go up there. Regarding Moana, that was one of those instances where I feel like when Pixar goes all human, they tend to struggle. If they don't have an, uh, an object or a thing that they can kind of kind of humanize through. Like Wally, Wally was about the robots yeah. helping the humans. The humans were just kind of like the side characters. It was all about the robot. Bugs Life, perspective through a bug. Yeah. Finding Nemo. Cars, which I'd never really particularly care for, but Cars. Then you had Toy Story, which is the most, until you got to The Incredibles, which was the first human Yeah, and that's family. the exception to the rule that yeah. you just said. Yeah. But yeah. When, they, when they try to go with, you know, with Soul, Coco, even, you know, trying to follow, you know, it, it gets into this war area. I enjoyed Brave. I actually like Brave. I liked Brave up to a certain point. And when when uh her mother gets turned into a bear, uh spoiler alert, yeah, I was done. I was like, what the hell is going on here? That that aspect of the story completely turned me off. That reminds me when they do all human stories, there's the thing where they change a human into some other either an animal <laughs> or an object to get that see if there's some kind of vibe going on there. Yeah. I feel like that's what they do when they start off with an all human cast. Yeah. And so now for me, pre dating Pixar, uh, when Disney was releasing those classic animation animated movies in theaters, it was kind of the opposite of what you're talking about now. I preferred the movies that had the human characters, starting with uh Little Mermaid, even though she was half human. Uh you know, followed by Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin. Those are some of my favorite Disney movies of all time, and those were all, for the most part, human-based. Now, I am in the well, minority here. No, no, no. I was saying this predates yeah. Pixar. Um, I'm in the minority here that when Disney went all animal in The Lion King, I didn't like The Lion King. And I know that shocks the heck out of people because when you ask most people, what are your favorite Disney movies, Lion King is like number one for a lot of people lion king did not do it for me please direct all angry mail to <laughs> joe the blasphemer at uh, gmail.com and i i just watched it again recently I, I bought it on dvd i wanted it to be part of my dvd collection because i think dvds are disappearing um but i did buy lion king and just recently watched it and i enjoyed it i i can't say that i hate the movie or anything like that it just doesn't rank highly on my list of disney movies and I, and again, I might be in the minority here. I probably am in the minority here. I thought that some of the songs in Lion King were some of the worst Disney songs. Yeah. The song "I Can't Wait to Be King" just sounded like bad pop. Yep. Like not, not that. What are the the composers' names? Alan Menken. Menken, and yeah. there's another one. The, the The Beauty and the Beast and Little Mermaid and Aladdin. Oh, yeah. Those songs were like. Broadway show tunes. They were rich and 
just, you know, you could sing them. You watch the movie once and you're singing those movies or those songs after the movie, you know. And Lion King, I didn't care necessarily for the music. I thought it was too poppy and not Broadway enough. Would Lion and King make your Mount Rushmore? Not in any category. <laughs> no. <laughs> None. No. I, I'm talking about just Disney animation. <laughs> yeah. Movies. No, I... No. Lion King is like near the bottom for me. And I, again, I know people are going to say, you're, you're out your goddamn mind. Uh, but no, but Lion King didn't do it for me. For me, it's Little Mermaid. That Just wouldn't, make my, do anything for wouldn't you, make my rush. I, Aladdin and Beauty and the Beast would. Yeah, yeah. For two, but I still, I don't know if they, if Little Mermaid makes my uh, Mount Rushmore. Yeah, when Little Mermaid came out, uh, it wasn't on my radar. I kind of dismissed it as just a movie for kids or whatever. And then I started, you know, hearing all the feedback from people who were like, oh, my God, that's amazing. And when I finally did get around to seeing the original animated Little Mermaid, I was blown away. I'm like, this is incredible. But the one thing that shocked me was the the violence and the darkness. Like, imagine having a three-year-old or a four-year-old, and you're thinking, oh, I could show them Little Mermaid. There's some messed up yeah. stuff in Little Mermaid. I guess all Disney movies have some messed up aspect of well, it. Well, not but. as bad as showing them the Black Cauldron. <laughs> That'll put you on someone's dirty list for a while. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Little Mermaid, I enjoy it now. It wasn't necessarily geared toward me, but uh, the, the music was amazing. But, yeah, surprisingly uh, dark twist in a lot of those movies. I mean, you could look at Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin and... I remember uh, seeing uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame and going, okay, this is really weird. When they had that religious figure, like, smelling her hair and stuff, I'm like, what is going on? So, yeah, Disney movies get a little dark. I had a friend kind of make a comment. He goes, oh, I see. That guy does it, and it's creepy. Joe Biden <laughs> does it, and it's fine, huh? Okay. I'm like, oh, come on, man. Let's not do it. Can't we just talk about Pocahontas or something? Yeah. So getting back to Moana, uh, I I only watched Moana fairly recently, within probably the last six months or so. Yeah. It was okay. Again, it just took some weird turns in the story. But here's here's a gripe that I have, and I don't know if you guys agree with this or not. I, for one, really respect voiceover actors that, you know, a single person can play a multiple of different characters. There's a guy, I, I wish I could pull his name up, but uh, he does, he voices all the clones in the Bad Batch uh, animated series, and every clone sounds distinct and different, but it's one guy doing all the voices. So I really admire voiceover actors. When you cast The Rock in Moana, all I hear is The Rock. Yep. And even when he's singing, it's The Rock trying to sing. Yeah. I don't like the trend of... Uh, stunt casting voiceover roles with known actors and and i i can't i can't separate myself from that i i hear the rock in moana there yeah go ahead uh, i was just gonna say i i i completely agree with that because <laughs> for two for two things uh the first one is what you said joe is he's a extremely popular actor not just in America, but the world around. So when when people see that the animation th and hear it, they're going to be like, "Oh, okay, I know who that is." Yeah. Now, from Disney's point of view, it makes sense because yeah, they're going to spend a little more money, but that's a draw. Yeah, it's right. it's a Dwayne Johnson film now. The downside to that is you're putting somebody out of work who has spent probably. 15 to 30 years developing their voice yeah. and you're taking that job from them. Somebody who's probably not worth a uh, hundred million dollars like the rock <laughs> is. Yeah. And Do you need more money, Dwayne. Right. Right. But you're, you're taking that, that job from that person who, who probably really needs it. Yeah. I think, I, yeah, I, that, that doesn't sit right with me. But it, it goes to both you both said. Could you think of who, who's the actor that played uh, Princess Jasmine or Aladdin or Belle or Beauty? They're all yeah. It's hard stage to actors. name them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're all great performances. They're all. I felt they've all been trying to capture the Robin Williams magic from 
when they brought Robin Williams, yes. like, that's Robin Williams. Yeah, yeah. That, I think that was a turning point. They were like, it, oh, my God, but you, but you need – those are that's the exception, not the rule. Yeah, and that's that's Robin Williams. Like they just hit record and said, "All right, do your thing, Robin. We'll get back to you when we'll you're animate done. around you." Like that's that's Robin Williams. Yeah, and and it's like you 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 don't have to follow the script. Just start talking, improvising. <laughs> we got a camera on you. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and so even though you know, I, I guess I'm kind of being a hypocrite here because when I do watch Aladdin. I hear Robin Williams. I, that's Robin Williams. But he was so brilliant in that role, and Will Smith just couldn't hold a candle to but, him but in the live-action But, action but it's remake. little things like that. I mean, I think it's the comedians. Billy Crystal. Yeah. You can hear Billy Crystal both in Monsters, Inc., and I think, was he was he Pumbaa? Uh, no, I think he was only Monsters, Inc. Uh, Monsters Nathan, Inc. Lane, Nathan Lane. Uh, Nathan Lane was the meerkat. Yeah, meerkat. And I forget the actor's name who was the warthog, but... But yeah, Billy Crystal just did Monsters, Monsters Inc. Inc. And yeah, it's 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 him and John Goodman. They're clearly Billy Crystal and John Goodman. So yeah, even though they, they were great in those roles, I'm just not a fan of the stunt casting. And you know, it's it's kind of funny. Pixar sort of painted themselves into a corner because uh the, imagine the first time that John Ratzenberger voiced a character in a Pixar movie. I think it was Ham in Toy Story. And somehow they decided that they were going to bring him back for every Pixar movie. He's been, I think, in every Pixar movie, at least a cameo. The problem with John Ratzenberger is when you hear his voice, you go, oh, there it is. There's John Ratzenberger. There's his cameo. And you're, you're no longer invested in the fantasy of this film. Now you're seeing John Ratzenberger behind a microphone voicing this character. But does it also come down to performances? Like, when I hear, I can hear Tim Allen in Buzz, but I like how, how Tim Allen described him. I was playing playing a guy as if he had a closed head injury. <laughs> That's how he described Buzz Lightyear. I played him as if he, and then Tom Hanks was basically, you could hear Tom Hanks, but yeah. it's, it's the emotion. I think they did a test. If you ever get a chance, anybody out there to get up, watch a Pixar story. It's a documentary done about it. Yeah. It's an absolutely fabulous documentary. I'd recommend it. I think it's on Disney Plus if it's still there. And you see the type of creativity and, and Kind of like the frenetic pace they went to making that, and when they recruited Tom Cruise, uh, Tom Cruise, Tom Hanks, it was amazing. They did a little test run. They took a t- Turner and Hooch scene there. Not the car. Oh, you hate the car, <laughs> you stupid dog. <laughs> and they animated Woody doing that. And he said this was unbelievable. I yeah. didn't know how to describe it to friends, but I was sold. Yeah, it is amazing how uh, Tom Hanks and and uh, and uh, what's his name, uh, Tim Allen, but well, Tim Allen. Um, how they are just linked to those characters. Like I can't imagine another actor stepping in to try and fill those roles. They couldn't do it. Now, one interesting thing is I was watching a interview with Tom Hanks and they pulled out a Woody doll and they pulled the string and it was like, there's a snake in my boots. And they said, is this you Tom? And he said, no, it is not. That is my brother. His brother has made a lucrative career impersonating Tom Hanks for Toy Story Unbelievable. merchandise. Unbelievable. Wow. Did you know that? No. I did not. Yeah. That is his brother voicing Woody in all Toy Story merchandise. That blew my mind. So That's false advertising. That is <laughs> you got to be careful about that. Uh, but I agree with what you're saying, though. I think what happened was, and kind of like Andrew was pointing out, they tried to capture the Robin Williams magic. There are certain actors, depending on how they relate to the, to the character, the effort they put in I, I sometimes think some of these stunt casting are just, it's a paycheck. Yeah. They come in, they say the lines, I can clearly hear it's you. There's no, it's, you know, you, you were talking on the voicemail. It could be like one of those cameo things they pay for. And I wish you happy birthday. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm not a fan of it. I, 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 I prefer quality. not, like you mentioned the actresses that voice Belle and, and Ariel. I prefer not picturing their faces when I watch those movies. But when you stunt cast, that's all I see are the celebrities that are voicing these, these things. So if I was, uh, you know, in charge, I would say, no, we're sticking strictly to voice over actors and they deserve that paycheck. Has Taylor Swift done any uh, animation yet? I'm not sure I yet. Don't. Not yet. But give it about eight months. The only thing that comes <laughs> to mind is uh, she was in the Cats musical. <laughs> that don't we, won't, we won't. We won't. We won't. That's for another podcast. I, I thought we were keeping this civilized, but apparently not. <laughs> Jeez. 
Um, one more thing I wanted to mention as far as uh, Disney's release uh, schedule this year. This isn't necessarily a Pixar release, but Disney is releasing a sequel, which is actually a prequel, to the live-action remake, which I want to say in quotes, live-action remake of The Lion King. So this isn't necessarily necessarily a prequel to the animated it's the live action prequel and this is kind of confusing so yeah i'm lost it tells the origin story of mufasa from the perspective of the grandchildren of rafiki and kiera after simba ascends to as the new leader of the <clears throat> pride lands so what is that pitch meeting? Yeah. Who sits in that? Uh, now hear me out. Whatever Joe just said. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. So it's basically going to be set with these characters. So in a way it's a sequel, but they're going to tell the story of how Mufasa came into power. So it's going to be a look back. So it's, it's kind of a prequel and a sequel at the same time, I guess. Mm. And I, I am confident. I will say right now, my butt will not be in the seat for that. No. And, no, no, and no. let's let's talk about that since we're into this. Disney has been doing these live yes, action remakes. Thank you. And the term live action, I don't even. I want to file a lawsuit. You I want to file a lawsuit against <laughs> Disney and say define live action. Yes, thank you. The the Lion King remake, as far as I know, is one hundred percent computer animation. There were no live lions used in the making of this I had a friend film. ask me that. Like, why is it not live action? <laughs> Have you heard a lion talk? <laughs> what lion moves its mouth like that? Go yeah. to the zoo. Stick your so, face that close. It'll eat you. <laughs> it's a computer animated movie. And when you look at live action remakes of Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast, those, other than a couple of human figures in there, for the most part, those movies are like 90% computer animated. So... I hate the fact that they're saying, oh, we're doing a live action remake of this. It's still a computer animated movie. If, if you're going to do a live action remake of Finding Nemo, you're not going to put real fish in there. These are going to be computer animated fish. You can't call it live action. It's a live action remake of a video game rampage. That's, <laughs> of course, a 75 foot white, white fur gorilla. I mean, come on. That's a big pet peeve of mine. That's, that's like, you know, saying, I can't believe it's not butter. Well, it's not butter. Um, so, yeah, I... It's a shameless cash grab. I have no interest in uh, seeing it. Um, was the... Have you guys seen the live-action version of The Lion King? I'm curious. Did they, I didn't see any of them. Is it a musical? Did they still sing they'll, songs? They'll, they'll force songs in them. I'm sure they will. They did it for Aladdin. They they try to recreate songs. Mm. Look, if it... if uh, it, You do you. Enjoy yourself. If you have a great time, go do it. That's like people that enjoy, you know... Star Wars Episode Nine. They were clapping and thought it was great. Like, hey, <laughs> you do you. My trip. My bus yeah. stop was Return of the Jedi. I tip my hat to you. You guys have fun. But it's the same thing. Disney's not mine. I, my Disney is for me, and I'm perfectly okay with that. If that makes me sound like a boomer or, or you know, past my generation, I'm fine. You guys get to enjoy it. I had a great time in the '90s, '80s, and '90s and early 2000s. Yeah. That was my jam. I got to enjoy it. I look. If you guys have fun with it, have fun with it. We're making a live action of it. Go ahead. Yeah. It's not an original story. Neither were, I mean, some of these were adaptations of stories, too. Yeah. I can't say, like, hey, you know, Beauty and the Beast was an original Disney thing. Actually, it's based off a fairy tale. Oh, it right. is. Go ahead. I was going to say, uh, the the one live action, uh, re, uh, whatever, remake that I did like, also directed by John Favreau, was The Jungle Book. I really did like that. They did a live action remake yeah. of that? Uh, 20, I have no it, memory of it, that. Yeah, 2016. Yep. Wow. I saw it in the theater and. It, I thought it was really well made. Hmm. Um, the 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 little kid who played uh, Mowgli uh, was great. Huh? Did Did you see it? No, I uh, when they said it's a live action, I'm like I've seen the animated. One. <laughs> well, <laughs> good. I read the book, and as far as I know, it got like pretty good reviews. Um, yeah, but anyway, I have no I, memory of it at all. I I really liked it, and uh, I would I would recommend seeing it compared to all the. From what I've heard, all the other live action remakes, you know, which I to, which I have not seen because I, they looked awful. But 
This one, I I, hmm. I really enjoy. Then I will do it. In an act of solidarity, for all the crap I've given Andrew on the show, <laughs> the movies he's not seen, I, can do, I can extend the When was the last time he brought up a movie he saw that neither one of us has seen? Oh, it happened. That's I can't say one. Yeah, I'm down. Shot. Mark it down. Yeah, it's very, it's very rare. <laughs> and it's usually one of those artsy flicks where, you know, it's only shown in one theater in a gully somewhere. <laughs> that Andrew's like, I was finding it when I was out there hanging out with some buddies, you know, drinking like, you know craft beer or something and it's remember like, this day no drink it no <laughs> yeah. drink it. and do an acid yeah, no, I'm <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now i did see uh beauty and the beast the live action remake i adore emma watson and i thought she was perfectly fine in that film i heard i heard it was it yeah was pretty the decent. one gripe that i have and this may may segue into something else but the one gripe i had with that movie is they were like oh we're gonna add like some new songs to this and i'm like okay and so when they sang the songs that were from the original animated version, those were great. And then here comes the new song. And I think the Beast was singing. And I'm like, this is awful. This new song is terrible. Why did you feel compelled to add this new song? And here's, here's a gripe that I have. I went to the theater to see the Mary Poppins sequel, I guess you would call it, oh, or yeah. reboot or something. Now, when you watch the original Mary Poppins, it's a delight. And those songs are just so catchy that you find yourself singing them immediately after watching the movie. But when I saw this reboot with Emily Blunt, I, there was nothing necessarily wrong with it. I thought she was fine in it. But every song was instantly forgettable. Like, nothing was in my brain. It's you know, a tough act to follow. Yeah. Dick Van Dyke and... and uh, uh, Ju- Julie Andrews. Julie Andrews. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. legend. I, when I, I mean, that's... That, was, that wasn't a me- memory pause. I literally... It's Julie Andrews. <laughs> for, uh, for those on TV, uh, on videos. Yeah. But, you know, trying to follow Dick Van Dyke and Julie Andrews, is, it's an impossible task. But not necessarily just those performances, but those songs. Yeah. So there's something about those early Disney songs, whether it's Snow White or, you know, whatever, those songs were just infectious, man. You found yourself singing those, uh, and they became just embraced and beloved by the American public. And now when a, a, a new Disney movie comes out, you're like, eh. I'm going to play devil's advocate on this. Andrew, so do you think it's more, because no one's had a chance, like, our childhood's already gone, so we've had our songs from our childhood and growing it, up. It is. Don't don't you do that because I'll if you start, I'll start. <laughs> but for, these songs are might be forgettable for us, but are they memorable for these kids who will become us one day and think back to sure. these songs? Sure. And because when when Mary Poppins came out back then, there was only there's no competition for it. Yeah, you will get Mary Poppins on Saturdays. You you it's Mary Poppins and nobody else. Now they got competition of yin yang. Yeah, and so th- that brings this up. So you say, well, will a future generation who grew up with these movies be singing these songs 10, 20 years from now? No, because they have Taylor Swift. They have other things that they've claimed as their own. Movies do not mean the same thing to the young people of today that they did when I was young. Excellent point. And I'm starting to sound like Yoda. Look, I so old to young eyes. Don't ask. Don't no. ask that question. They always say yes. They always say yes. I made that mistake. But to answer your question, no, these movies do not mean the same thing to this generation. Well, I think you. I think Andrew might have mentioned this in a couple, couple a few shows ago. Taylor Swift's concert would sell out at a movie theater faster than an actual movie. Yeah, oh, yeah. easy. And Beyonce's tour would sell out on a movie theater, and, and AMC and other show uh, theater chains would rather show that then dedicated yeah. theater and so yeah you're right there's competition it's I mean, look what they're competing against now since we're talking about taylor swift i will justify bringing this up because her concert movie is airing on disney plus i believe so i watched it this past weekend and i was texting my niece who's a huge fan and my sisters giving them my feedback and i will say this even though i wasn't familiar with probably 75 percent of the songs that she performed I did think the production values were amazing, and she's very, very talented. But I will say this. When a song, when she started performing a song that I was familiar with, a big smile broke out across my face, and I I felt like one of those 
kids that you see on TikTok that stand in front of the TV six <laughs> inches away and start singing the song. Her songs are pretty catchy if you're familiar with them. So yeah, Taylor Swift is is what these kids will remember 20 years from now. Andrew, Joe's just solved Disney's problem. Hire Taylor Swift to write the songs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you imagine a Taylor Swift penned Disney musical? Oh, Alan Menken man. and oh. Taylor Swift are con- conducted the story, uh, the it's soundtrack gold. for gold. By the way, you ho- you owe Hollywood blockbusters for that idea. Yeah, hey, welcome Disney. Disney. <laughs> you you consult with us. We put it out there, but yeah. Oh my gosh, that would. I be I was just looking this up, and the last memorable. Uh, Disney song I can remember was 11 years ago with Frozen, Let It Be. Or Let It Go. Let it be. Or, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You're thinking not, the, not, the, not Beatles. the Beatles. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Let It Go, which came out 11 years ago. Yeah. Now, can anyone think of a a popular Disney song in, in the popular lexicon since then? I can't. Right. But Now, someone that, out there might be saying, oh, a song from Moana or something. Was yeah. Th- no. I agree with you. That might be the last earworm that Disney released yeah. that everybody was singing. Yeah. And, and that's but, another, that goes back to uh, that classic Broadway sound. That, yeah, that yeah, song yeah. was epic. It was big yep. and it was catchy. And, and uh, in the nineties, you know, you, you had uh, a whole new world with Aladdin, yep. uh, the uh, oh, Little yeah. Mermaid song. Uh, Beauty and the Beast, uh, yeah. Tales of the Lion time. King song. Yeah, and, yeah. But since then, the last eleven years, you got a friend in me. And why is that? Why? Why is Disney not churning out the beloved classics that they did from the beginning? Like, I mean, you know, I, I just recently rewatched Snow White, and you know, someday my prince will come, and hi ho, hi ho. Those yeah. are from the get go. Those songs were catchy and memorable and that continued for what it comes on 40 to, 50 years i think it comes down to the story and that's where i think pixar was really great when toy story came out lasker had this effect of taking putting you know emotion and life into inanimate objects yeah. toy story was fantastic you know yes. you, you, you know you got a friend in me it's great when you sit down in 1995 yeah. and you watch that like this is great <laughs> and you felt for all those characters and it it's one of those things that gets you thinking my to- when I was a kid, I had toys. I had Transformers, GI Joe. They all meant something to me. They got me through tough times. I enjoyed playing with them. And then I get older, and I just throw them in this little bin as yeah. if they're nothing. And, you know, my mom sometimes gives them the- gives them the way, which and I cry about because they're <laughs> worth so much because they're Transformers, and I can't believe they're. Go- I don't want to get into it. This just happened last week. <laughs> yeah. You did. What? I don't want to talk about <laughs> it. You gave them away. <laughs> I didn't know they would be worth something. Oh, it's like I-, I threw away a card by some baby Ruth. Baby Ruth. Now, since you brought this up, I'm going to use this opportunity to transition, to segue to our favorite Pixar movies. And if you want to throw out your favorite Disney Disney movies, too. I almost said Disney. Uh, If you want to include your favorite Disney movies, you can. But I concocted a top ten list of my favorite Pixar movies. And uh, the funny thing is, is that this is going to this isn't going to take a whole lot of time because the top 3 movies on my list are all Toy Story movies. 1, <laughs> 2 and 3 in my opinion should be considered one of the greatest trilogies in the history of films. Yeah. You got your Star Wars trilogy, you got your Indiana Jones trilogy, you got your Rocky trilogy. Uh Toy Story ranks right up there. Um the original tr- Toy Story that came out in 1995 that introduced us to all these characters. It was the very first fully computer an- yeah. uh, animated film ever, uh, which was a milestone along the lines of Jurassic Park and all these other movies that changed cinema. Yeah. Toy Story changed $30 cinema. $30 million dollar budget. Yeah, yeah. And it was so funny and so charming with the... Uh, uh, you know, uh, jokes for adults as well as kids, and that's what that's what's so great about a lot of these movies is they're they're not kid movies. Parents who take their kids to the theater to watch these movies are just as entertained as the little ones, maybe more so. Um, so, Toy Story kicked it all off in '95. Four years later, uh, we got Toy Story Two with the in, the introduction of the uh, the toy collector character, that's my favorite. Uh, that's my favorite voiced one. by Wayne Knight, who was just brilliant in that. 
And that was just outstanding. Uh, and then Toy Story 3, which came out 11 years later, 2010, had me sobbing yeah. like my mom just sold my Star Wars action figures at a garage sale. Um, I was sobbing at the thought of these toys changing ownership and being handed down to the next generation. Um, those three movies, I, I wish I had children that I can sit down and introduce them and watch their reaction to these movies for the first time. Uh, they're as good as anything I've seen. Where do the Toy Story movies rank on your uh, Disney slash Pixar list? I always use my favorite Mount Rushmore thing, which, by the way, I will visit one day. I'm not, I'm not, I've never actually visited, got a chance to visit Mount Rushmore, but I will. Uh, no, Toy Story 2 is the best Pixar movie for me because of the themes it had. There's this really entertaining thing with, with Kelsey Grammer great, gave a great performance in there, too, as the villain, yeah. as the prospector. And it says kids, and I think it was Tim Allen's Buzz Lightyear tells, he's like, toys are meant to be played with kids. Oh, mm -hmm. what's the point? You're not meant to be stared at in plastic and yeah. stood behind the wall. What's the? It's not a purpose in a toy's life. <laughs> I wish I had the audio drop. Do you guys remember there was a Saturday Night Live skit, and they were doing uh, one of the new Star Wars movies were coming out, and they were rolling out the new action figures, and you see these kids go, you know, get the new Kylo Ren and blah, 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 blah. And you could play with them and have fights. And then these grown men pop in and go, or you can leave them in the box. And that was hysterical. And it spoke directly to me. <laughs> do you just keep them in the package and put them on a shelf? Or do you let the little ones rip them open and play with them? There's something about playing with the toys. And, and believe me, my Star Wars figures, which I still have today, I played with them when I was a kid, but I took very good care of them. Right. So today I have all the weapons and all that stuff. But, yeah, these movies spoke to me uh, but, and, uh, and about that argument. But I loved it. I loved when John Lasher said "What? It's told the story's told from the perspective of a toy. Yeah. Like a toy spends, you know, if people always say, oh, I, I treat my car like my baby. They actually name their car. I'm like, so if you can have the kind of transference to a car, yeah. you, you, you put that kind of emotion into a car, why not a, why not a toy? Yeah. You know, and yeah, years ago, probably about 20 years ago or so, uh, I came into some financial difficulty and I had a large collection of uh, like 12 inch figures from movies and television and stuff like that. And when I made the decision that I had to sell them so that I can pay bills, that was tough. Every time I'd sell one on eBay and I sat there and pulled out the bubble wrap and put it in a cardboard box and sealed it up, I had to like compose myself i hated uh boxing those up and selling them off that was tough so i don't know if everyone can relate to that but uh, i loved my toys growing up i still love toys today i'm still a collector today now some people might say uh oh you're an idiot for collecting toys now i want to go buy some uh sports cards well <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. the same thing your little square of cardboard isn't much different than my Luke Skywalker action figure. Right, it's basically right. the same thing. I have, I have a friend who collects sports memorabilia. I, I and I think one of the joys he said that in giving them up, he gave them to, he tried, I think he donated them to a museum. And so he'd go by there and he'd see people enjoying it. So, he's, so that was kind of like, okay, I gave it away, but at least others get to see it. So all the memories I have of when I acquired it with my, when it was my dad, my uncle, my grandfather, yeah. going to the ballpark and blah, blah, blah. He said, I would see some kids, and if they ever asked questions, I'd go and tell them, and I'd share them stories about the thing and all that, and see them get fascinated. So that was kind of the, the trade-off. Yeah. And you made peace with it. It was like uh, paying it forward. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So maybe in that in that case, you know, they can't play with it. If you can actually see some of the toys you give to another child, and they play with it, and you say, okay, this is now yours. You take good care of take good care of him. Yeah. Like I did. He got me through some tough times, so you, you play with him, and he'll, he'll get you yeah. through, too. And you kind of make your, and that's where Toy Story captured that perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. Passing them down to the yeah. next generation. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Speaking of sports cards, I just saw something recently uh, on TikTok. Someone was doing like a top 10 list of uh, Michael Jordan cards. Now, back in the early 90s, my brother got me into collecting sports cards, and I had a pretty impressive basketball card collection. But at the time, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this era. Cards were overproduced. Yes. And a lot of cards from the 90s really for the next decade or more didn't really appreciate in value. As a matter of fact, a lot of them went down. 
And um, I had every Michael Jordan card except for his rookie card, but I had his rookie sticker and a bunch of other early cards that at the time... To burn them. Uh, yeah, they just never... <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it was going to be an investment, and then I'm like, well, these aren't really appreciating. So I sold off a few, and then there was this woman that I worked with. I found out her son uh, collected sports cards, and so I walked into the office one day with a big box, and I said, give these to your son. He'll appreciate appreciate him more than me. Well, I stumbled across this TikTok video the other day. They're like, here are the top 10 Michael Jordan cards. Nine of the 10 cards that they listed, I owned. (laughs) And the only one that I never was able to afford, even in the early days, was his rookie card. His rookie card was always expensive. But the grand total of the nine cards outside of his rookie card that I owned probably are worth around $50,000. But I'm like, oh, no. Joe, you can you can sell your Mustang and get a brand new one, man. Yeah. I'll tell you what, no, for everyone, and, everyone in the studio, Joe just had an in-studio proctology uh, exam. <laughs> so, and I, believe me, I don't have any regrets. I never would have sat on those cards for well, 40 years or whatever. But, uh, but when I saw those numbers, and of course, these are graded. I would have had to send them out to get graded. But, sure. yeah, it's weird to think that for the longest time, those cards were worthless. And now, all of a sudden, the sports card industry is blowing up. My my and, brother had the old Star Wars stuff, and you know, and when we moved to India at one point, they, my mom and dad made them sell them, and mm. he's like, "Oh, if I only had kept them, and I wanted to." Yeah, but yeah, you think about stuff like that. I would keep the Michael Jordan rookie card, and I would keep the Washington Wizards card because I wanted to see him in another uniform. I'd yeah, burn yeah. the rest. Yeah. Now, are you guys familiar with the blue Snaggletooth figure? From so Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard of it. I, I've never seen a picture. Of it. Yeah, so the story goes that um, when the Star Wars figures were coming out in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, Sears was able to offer this exclusive cantina playset. And one of the figures that was included in this Sears playset was a tall uh, snaggletooth figure that had a blue outfit. And Kenner realized, oh, we messed that up. They found out that Snaggletooth was a short little thing in a red outfit. So when they re-released this figure to the mass market, they made the little short red one. And I never really thought much about the tall blue one. And and had I really wanted it back then, I probably could have got it for a decent price. Well, today, that figure sells for $400, $500, $600. If you send it out to get graded, and if it's in good condition, a thousand, two thousand dollars. I'm like, uh, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> you mean if you take it in to get graded? I would never send it out because it's not coming back. <laughs> well, that's how that's, people send in like you know wow. Michael Jordan rookie cards, and they they that's come amazing. back. That's amazing. Well, that's you know that's a very good service, and that's a reputable service. Yeah, but yeah, so a lot of stuff from my youth. Uh, you know, you play with them or whatever, and you don't really think about the value, and then. For the longest time, there wasn't like a lot of interest in Star Wars figures. And now, like the sports card industry, things are blowing up. So check your attics, check your basements, look for that Woody dollar, that Buzz Lightyear doll. And who knows what adventures they're having when you're not looking. That's another thing I always, you know, I, and I, I, what I love about Lasser, he, he would ask those questions that you all wondered about. What do what my toys do when I'm not there? <laughs> That's right. What kind of I adventures and trouble do they get into? I have several uh, completely filled up. Uh, baseball uh hardcover books you know with the sleeves that you put yeah the, the cards that i that i collected when i was probably eight nine ten in my parents basement uh mm. i might need to go over them oh it'd be <laughs> fun to pull it yeah. out and go through them yeah yeah get those hermetically sealed because there there could be something really valuable in them my yeah. now i i don't i don't want to speak about this too much but eventually when 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 my father uh, passes on to the uh, the great unknown. Um, he has, at minimum, four thousand vinyl records. Ooh. Oh wow! And he's told me, yeah, Andrew, I, I, I got an, uh, uh, a Beatles imp- like the original Beatles import from the UK mm. that they never released in the United States, and all you know, all this mm. stuff. And it's like, Dad, are you? Are you sure you don't want to put this on eBay? We can <laughs> we can make two hundred dollars on this. If you look He's at the like, vinyl, you can see he, the fingerprint when I snatched it from John's hand. He <laughs> he will not get rid of a single vinyl. Wow, that's that's how emotional. Fine line between collector and hoarder. 
Yes. I, yes. Yeah. For the most part, except for the stuff I grew up with, I, I can part with just about anything except for the stuff from my youth. I, yeah. I, I told my sister, bury that stuff with me in my <laughs> coffin. Um, and then we got to know exactly where you're buried so, <laughs> so Nick and I can get a couple shovels out. and uh, Nick, keep an eye out. <laughs> yeah, great. We're going to be haunted by Joe now. <laughs> what are you doing? Now, along the lines, and I know we're a little off topic here, but along the lines of what you just said about the vinyl album, I have a friend. I won't name names because I don't want anyone coming after him, but he told me this amazing story about how his dad revealed to him that he had a collection of vintage comic books that were just sitting in a long box uh, in the attic someplace. And so my friend bought uh, a comic book price guide and said, well, let's go through them, Dad. And so they go up in the attic, they open up the box, and the dad would pull out a comic, read the title and the issue number, and then my friend would look it up in the price guide. So he's calling off titles, calling off titles, and then one title he calls off is Amazing Fantasy number 15. Now, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Amazing Fantasy 15, but it's the very first appearance of Spider-Man ever, and graded can sell for a million or more dollars <laughs> ungraded. I remember watching an issue of uh, American pickers where they came across one. And I think, oh, gosh, that was maybe 60,000 or something like that. Uh, like not graded, but imagine going through comics in an attic and, and finding out that you have, you know, there's, there's, there's like some Holy grails of comics. There's amazing fantasy for Spider-Man. There's detective comics for Batman and there's action comics for Superman. If you find any one of those in a box in your attic, you're, you're good. You can retire. You know, Mark, who we've had on the show before, uh, has spoken about the comic book bubble that was in the nineties where people like, like sports cards were just printing them yeah. and make, you know, Oh, yes. this is like a Chrome cover. Like why is this yeah. a Chrome cover? This makes no sense. Yeah. They were, com- they were creating artificial demand. Right. Yes. But yeah. now, and after the bubble burst, now if you happen to have a couple of those after yeah. they've been used as, you know, hamster cage lining and all that <laughs> kind of stuff, now they're worth something because you buy, you d- the, the market's kind of self-corrected. Now some yeah. of those are actually worth something. I remember everyone got excited when uh, they published the death of Superman and I, everybody ran out and bought that comic and put yeah. it away. My 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 grandma bought me that uh that that yeah. original comic. I don't know where it is, but I I know I never got rid of it. Well, the so. problem is, you know, things increase in value when there's supply versus demand, and that particular issue everyone bought, everyone put away. And yeah, so yeah. if everyone has one in a mylar bag, yeah, there's not going to be a huge demand. For it might that. be worth thirty bucks, right. unless they haven't anymore. Then all of a sudden, it's like, wait a minute! Oh my god! I just want to. Mom's like, I got rid of that. I yeah. need to find that, and and, and at yeah. least look it up just to just yeah. to see. I'm curious, you know, what it, what it might be worth. But yeah, I, w- I would never get rid of that because who knows? Twenty years from now, they sell me. You know, you can't predict. I didn't read comics as much back then, but I remember Tom Brokaw saying, and today Superman died. I went, wait, what? He was real this whole time? <laughs> he made NBC Nightly's news? Well, that's just then. Superman's <laughs> dead. <laughs> oh, I miss Tom Brokaw. Yeah. All right, back to our uh, Pixar top 10 list. Uh, Toy Story occupies the top three spaces. Uh, four and five on my list can be interchangeable. Either one of them could be four. Uh, The Incredibles, 2004, Cars, 2006. I know you said you're not a fan of Cars, but I really loved the nostalgic feel of Cars and and hearkening back to the the days of Route 66 and getting bypassed because of the freeway and all that stuff. And uh, I'm a car guy, so I love those two movies. But Incredibles, what's what's great about Incredibles is that it's not based on any existing property. It's just an original Pixar slash Disney creation that just absolutely blew me away. Now, I mean, I guess you can loosely compare them to the Fantastic Four or something like that, but uh, The Incredibles was was great. I mean, definitely one of the best uh, Pixar films. Uh, after Cars, I got uh, Finding Nemo, 2003, and then 13 years later, Finding Dory. I thought Alan did a great job in Finding Dory. The character's absolutely lovable. And and uh, so that's six and seven on my list. Uh, probably close to a record between uh, a movie and its sequel. 14 years, uh, Incredibles 2 came out in 2018, and that blew me away. I thought that was absolutely outstanding. That raccoon scene. 
<laughs> oh my with, god, with the baby, great. that was awesome. Yeah, uh, and then to round up my uh, round up my top ten, the Bugs Life, nineteen ninety eight. Yeah. I really loved that. David Foley, who I loved in Kids of the Hall, uh, he did that one voiceover gig. Uh, and then um, top number ten on my list is Monsters Inc. Uh, two thousand one. Um, I just recently watched Monsters University, which I enjoyed, but um, now that's my that's my top ten. What what would uh, Nick? What would be in your top ten uh, that uh, might surprise us? All three Toy Stories would make it. Uh, Bugs Life would make it. Wally would make it. Incredibles would make it. Uh, Let's talk about Wally for a second. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that. I saw Wally in the theater, and I I remember not liking it. And here's the reason: it was out of all of Pixar's movies, it was the most cynical. Yeah, like it had a very cynical look at the human race and where we were headed. But now I apologize <laughs> because it was spot on. They <laughs> nailed it. People overweight blobs with with devices up against their face that they just couldn't look away from. I'm like, holy cow, this is almost like Nostradamus quality. So I take back any negative thing I ever said about But no, Wally. I remember the time watching, like, you see Earth ruined and <laughs> yeah. everyone's gone and disposable like a, yeah, and the humans are just like plugging on these little floating chairs when they get the tiptoe it's like a man a sea man a sea cow <laughs> fell over like oh my god really yeah. this is what you think of us like oh i get it wally has aged very very well and now has become uh satire i guess i don't know what you call it but man they were spot on so what i thought was being overly cynical when it came out now i admit they they knew better than I. And the thing is, for me, for Pixar, it's, I I loved, I was at the, I wasn't a kid, but I was a teenager, and I was just becoming, you know, getting over 18, going into becoming a young man. So I was at that perfect range where I got the adult humor, and I got the kid humor. I got to enjoy it all. Yeah. And that was basically hitting back to back to back to back home runs. I got Toy Story, Bugs Life, Toy Story that 2. Was a great period. You know, uh, they would just keep going and I, I had Wally, I had The Incredibles. I was like they can't miss. Yeah. There there was like a string. I was like, "Hey, you know, we're just going to Cooperstown on this." You guys <laughs> when when does yeah. this machine stop? Yeah, it's like a home run derby. And that's why, you know, when they were that popular, I, I don't know if I have a top 10 because I I always go with top 4 because then I feel like I'm cheating because I have to make tough choices. Then it's Toy Story 2, Wally, The Incredibles, and and I would go with Monsters Inc. Okay. That's my top four. Andrew, I, what yeah. do you got, Andrew? Okay, so I've only seen uh one third of the twenty seven movies. I've hmm. only seen nine. That's fair. Which which nine are we talking about? <laughs> this is very critical to saving okay. you right now. So I, I I can for sure go by my top three at first. Sure. Um so I'd have to go with cars. That's fair. That's fair. Number uh, one? I absolutely love that movie. I and, have no problem with that at all. And awesome. I watched it two nights ago for the first time in probably 10 years. Um, I, I, I think it's really cool how all, all of the people who are supposed to be, or all the characters who are supposed to be human are vehicles, which I think is hilarious. <laughs> Even uh, the, the, the little guys who are forklifts, yeah, yeah. you know, they're, I mean, that, that, that's helpers. Pixar DNA. Inanimate <laughs> objects come yeah, to life. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I love the fact, and you briefly uh, mentioned this, mentioned this show of how uh, a small town uh, saw its decline after uh, the freeway went through. The yeah. freeway went through, and I I don't remember what if it was supposed to be I forty or I uh, twenty yeah. going through there, like the southwest. Um, and then. It showed a semi-realistic view of how these small towns are today. Right. Like, uh, businesses just barely functioning, and most mm -hmm. of the people have moved out. Any businesses that are successful on Route 66, it's solely because of nostalgia. That yeah. there are people yep. who say, you know what? I've always wanted to do that Route 66 thing, and that's what these businesses are counting on. Right. Yep. And then, and then the the whole uh, character arc of um, lightning, yeah, lightning, yeah. How you know he's he's hot off a win, and he's uh, he's driving out to is it Vegas or L.A. to yeah for the big uh, race, for the yeah. big race, and then he 
he runs up against a big uh, reality check when he you know has to have that detour off into the city, and yeah. he realizes, oh wow, um, I'm out of my element, and yeah. these people live a lot differently than me. And when you think about it, some of the most successful movies in film history are the fish out of water yeah. story. Yes, he yes. was totally thrown into an ele- element that was unfamiliar with him and learned from it and right. grew from it. So, and I then, love it. And then, of course, like any good story, he had uh, a variety of people, uh, characters within the story who view him slightly differently. Like mm-hmm. there's some people who accept him as he is right away. And then at the other, uh, other end of the spectrum, you have the, um, uh, the character, but, uh, Voiced by uh, Paul Newman. Oh yeah, Doc. 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 Yeah, yeah. Who, who's you know, he's very, you know, by the book and very yeah. strict. The young hot shot coming to but, town. But then later on, you realize he he used to be a a yeah. racer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And becomes his mentor. And yeah. yep. But then, uh, Lightning brings something uh, to to the town. Uh, he helps him, you know, repave the road after right, it got man. you know messed up and everything. Um, it's not a very long movie. I think it's only about an hour and a half, which yeah, is which crazy. is good. Yeah, yeah, that's for that type of movie. Um, I remember seeing it in theaters when it came out in two thousand six. I don't remember who I saw it with, but I just remember walking out. I'm like, you know, I'm not the world's largest animation, uh, you know, Disney animation mm-hmm. person, but that movie for whatever reason just really spoke to me, and it's yeah. like I felt so positive walking out of there i agree man just it it did a lot for me yeah and the things they did to that movie like uh, lassiter and his animators you know they would go to a a race car track nascar track and kind of study everything and when the cars would zip by they'd see these little what they call black marbles and they're like what's that and they're like well that's the rubber coming off the tires they form these little black marbles and Uh Lasseter like turned to his animator and said, "We need to put that in our film. So when next time you watch Cars, look for the little yeah. black marbles dancing on the racetrack when the cars go by. That's the that's the attention they had to detail. Wow. Okay. And yeah. it's, it's mixed. They did the same with Bugs Life. They put a camera on a little stick and they rode it through the back, <laughs> the back garden. They're like, yeah. you just see the perspective. Like, oh wow, it looks like yeah. a different world. It's impressive. Yeah. So who else is in your top? So uh. What this, this this is a tie, um, toys. A tie for number two, uh, Toy Story, simply because it was, it was the first one. It, right. It started it. I remember. I don't remember who took my sister and I to the theater. But that came out in what ninety five. Yep. Yeah. So I was only eleven. I was I was young young enough. To, you were the you were the target audience. Yeah, I was young young enough to yeah. to get the animation. And, but also to see, like, to, to understand what was going on, you know, like, okay, there's, there's a, there's a kid and his toys, but, you know, maybe there's another life and, you know, it, it, it really, um, brought back some, uh, imagination. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nostalgia. Yeah. Yeah, Nostalgia. And, and being 11 at that time, it's that middle period of like, all right, for me, like I got to get rid of my my toys. Can't, <laughs> can't be playing with that anymore. And look at looking forward to you know trying to be an adult, but it's still. You were getting it at eleven. For me, it was probably about fourteen yeah, you, when I started. Oh man, I was Andrew. They didn't even let yeah. you get to your teens before you have to start thinking about being an adult. <laughs> And all yeah. that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, hey, all right, dude. I don't know. Like I bought I bought Empire Strikes Back figures. So I was I was about 13, 14 when Empire Strikes Back came out. And then there's a cutoff there where I have no figures after that. So right around when I turned thirteen and fourteen, that's when I was like, Okay, I'm done with toys. Girls are pretty. Yeah, yeah, I respect yeah, that. Yeah. You made that decision at fourteen. Andrew had to make that choice at eleven. I did it at thirty two. <laughs> <laughs> well now I'm a born again uh toy collector. So and then then my third one and I have I have a couple like others that are just under my top three but uh the one that really got me emotionally was up. Thank you. I can't believe oh, yeah. yeah up. Oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. That opening. Yeah. That that opening. Uh, 
with his wife. Yeah. And uh, him, uh, you know, having that little house where they're building that extra downtown around him. Yeah. It's like, and then he meets a little boy who's so innocent. <laughs> I um, think Andrew just triggered me because that, I can't <laughs> believe I, I, I blocked that. Because well, that here's, was. Here's what I'll say about up. Uh, the first. I don't know how long that opening montage lasts. Probably 15 or 20, I'm guessing. That long? It might be less than that. Nah, it's, it's less than that. Maybe less. I will say this. The first opening segment that tells a story between the guy and his wife is not only one of the greatest Pixar movies ever, but one of the greatest movies I've ever seen. Yeah. After that, not so much. I didn't really care with the, the dodo bird and, and the talking dog and all that. I found all that stuff kind of silly. But again, when it comes to like sobbing during a movie, yes. I can't believe the emotional impact that that first opening montage had on me when I saw up. And I, I was thinking about it like, if, if there, there there have been a couple times where I've teared up in movies, yeah. never once in the first fifteen right. minutes Ex- of it. Boy, never. they came at you with that. that yeah. came, I that was when I that came. I think that's why I almost had to block it out because I was like. <laughs> I, <laughs> Crying? What a dis- Am I sobbing? What What's is wrong? this salty discharge? I have a. I was at the Grinch. I have a heart. <laughs> oh my god! I have a heart. This is painful. What's going on here? It was pretty spectacular. And then yeah. uh, I'll, I'll just go just just for a minute. Um, some notable uh, follow ups. Um, I thought Finding Nemo was decent. Uh, Ratatouille was decent. Oh, Ratatouille. Uh, but I r- really really liked Monsters Inc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now. But he, but since then, um, the last Pixar movie I saw was Cars two in two thousand eleven. So it's been it's been a while. It's been wow. thirteen years since yeah. I've seen a Pixar yeah. movie. So I didn't hate Cars two. Um, it, it doesn't but, doesn't compare to the first. The problem one. with Cars two is when with the success of Car the first Cars, I'm sure the people at Disney and Pixar said, "Oh, the kids seem to like Mater. Let's do a whole movie around Mater as the main yeah. character." And Less Mater is more like yes. You can't revolve an entire movie around Mater. He's he's a sidekick, you know. So too, that's too, the the issue I too, have with too much two. of him is too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. I and mean, that's like when they tried to make a side character when they tried and they gave Lightyear his own movie. I went, oh right, it's uh, okay. It's good. It's not. It's yeah, not great. It's maybe, good, not great. Was it probably was it well necessary? Yeah. 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 I mean, that was one of those things where I'm like, Ugh, yeah, okay. yeah. And then they did Cars 3, which was which, more recent. Yeah, I've never seen And that, again, ranks among the most depressing movies that Pixar has ever uh, released. It's It basically has uh, Lightning coming to terms with the fact w- that he's old and obsolete. And I'm like, I don't want a Pixar movie to tell me I'm old and obsolete. I took that personally. So I, I re- it wasn't a... A bad movie, but it was very, very depressing. Was it was it kind of along the lines of how Toy Story, kind of, yeah, well, kind of leaned into obsolete toys? Yeah, or? kind of. Well, Toy Story or, Four kind of took it off the rails a little bit. That's why I don't put that up there. I don't even like talking about Toy Story Four. It's one of the I, most unnecessary sequels. I, I've ever. never seen it, and. I, 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 Everyone told me it's it's no. stick with the first three. Yeah, stick with the first, because at Toy Story Four, I mean, I don't care for spoilers. They broke up the group. That was like such a oh, weird thing because there was just like, yeah, oh that's my right. god. Yeah, that, I didn't care for that at all. You didn't have to do a fourth one to say, oh, guess what? We're splitting up the gang. I, there's no. a there's a theme running in Hollywood. I want to say where they take stuff that we grew up with and they're like, "This well, oh, but what happened now? Let's try to break it apart." Like, <laughs> no, I don't need to see Indiana Jones broken down. I don't need to see Luke Skywalker at the end of his like. Like, all right, guys, all right, if you really want to, I mean, why not just tell a whole new Star Wars story? Just take it in the universe and do something else with it. Yeah. Like, don't show me what happened to Flat uh, Lightning. Like, I don't, I, don't, I don't need to see what happens to all this. Stuff. Like, <laughs> yeah. like, just tell a different story. Like, are you going to show me The Incredibles when the kids are grown up and married and, like, have their <laughs> marital problems and dad, mom and dad are now in a time? Like, well, I don't Divorces, need to see. Divorces. Yeah. You're going to kill suicides. Frozen. Suicide. Like, Frozen got killed by the cops. Like, what are you going to do? Like, I mean, what are we doing here? <laughs> Jeez. You know, I just brought up. I brought up the highest grossing Pixar movies of all time. What would you say Ooh. ranks number one? Good question. Number one? Yeah. Ooh. Let me. Well, adjusting for inflation, I mean, I still go Toy Story two. Close. Toy Story three is oh, the wow. top grossing Pixar movie according to this list that just popped up. Uh, Finding Nemo number two. Yeah. Uh, up. 
number three. Okay. Incredibles number four. Finding Dory number five. Inside Out. And this kind of surprised me. Monsters University uh, cracks the top ten. Uh, hmm. Followed by Coco and Incredibles too. So, uh, yeah, those are your top grossing movies. And uh, that tells you what kind of movie Toy Story 3 is that it, it put butts in the seat. There's That spoke to not only young people, but adults. But that uh, also felt like back. they were kind of saying bye to that franchise. And I was, that's like Indiana Jones riding off into the sunset. I get yeah. it. Okay, let's end it there. Yeah. Nope, Don't not going to do it. bring <laughs> back. Yeah, it's just a money <laughs> cash grab or whatever. So is that it with your list, Andrew? Yep. All right. So, yeah, Pixar, you know, there was, there was a long stretch of time where they just could do no wrong. Every movie was great and made money and spoke to the old and young alike. Uh, lately, not so much, but we'll see. I feel like they lost that rebel spirit because, like I said, if you guys ever get a chance to watch a Pixar story, what they did to get a, pic- a Toy Story made and then Toy Story 2 made, was incredible. Mm-hmm. Toy Story, basically, they Jeffrey Katzenberg kept messing with it, and when they showed the, the stuff, they're like, this sucks. Like, why do we hate it? Like, it's not their movie. They, John Lasseter and the company rewrote and redid Toy Story in two weeks to take it back to Disney so they could mm-hmm. keep the movie going. Mm-hmm. And they did it. Toy Story 2, John Lasseter had to take a break because he'd done Bugs Life and Toy Story and went and had a vacation. Toy Story 2 was going to go straight to DVD. They said, no, let's put it in theater. They came back. It sucked, apparently. He mm. saw, they were like, you, you have nine months to get this. <laughs> they rewrote the movie in nine, redid the animation in wow. nine months. Whoa. To, Disney's like, we can't move the release date. It's fixed. Are you going to deliver it or not? Yeah. And so Peter Schneider, who was the head of animation at the time, was like, hey, don't wait for my notes. Just do whatever you got to do. Mm-hmm. Don't run it by me anymore. Just do it and pray. Wow. And, and they had that, they were like, this is like back in the old days. And they would just, they could finish each other's sentences. And they would just keep moving, and some of that, you know, you and then you have a hit after hit after hit, yeah. And then, well, that that really paid off, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and then they, and then people, you know, started doing their own name, and then Lasseter left, and then you kind of see there's something to be said where the 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 vibe and the type of way they tell stories maybe hit, the formula has changed, and yeah. they haven't really figured it out yet. So yeah, yeah. You know, we started off this podcast talking about Luca, how it got re-released this past yeah. weekend. Uh, here's here's the movie in a nutshell. Uh, Luca is a shape-shifting sea monster posing as a young boy who spends his summer on the lush Italian Riviera in 1959. It just makes no sense. And <laughs> like I said, as I'm watching it, it starts off with his underwater family who are like shepherds, they, they shepherd fish, which I don't know how they came up with that. And then Luca runs in to a fellow sea monster who ventures on to land. And the moment he steps foot on land, he, he transform into a human boy. And then he teaches Luca that he can do the same thing. And as I'm sitting there watching, I'm like, who came up with this? This is nonsense. A sea monster who transforms into a boy on land, and I tapped out. I'm like, and it kind no. of borrowed the theme from Little Mermaid. Kind of, yeah. We're, but she at least they established that she had like a wish granted right. to, to become human. Uh, and, but this, there was like no explanation as to why these sea monsters had the ability to turn into humans on land. And I just, I want Pixar just to get back to simple storytelling, either adapt beloved fairy tales that go back hundreds of years or come up, come up with something new. But what was uh, it? Elementals was the, was one of the ones that this came out. Did they do that one? Was Pixar I one with water, think fire? They did. Yeah. Talking about a society where all four live. And yeah. Now one, one Pixar movie that not a lot of people talk about that I really enjoyed. And I think there's going to be a sequel coming out in a year or so is Zootopia. Zootopia. Yeah. Uh, we have not discussed Zootopia. I can't and, believe because here's the thing: there, that's in the time when it was having hit after hit after hit. Zootopia yeah. was great. The original story, I'm glad they changed. The original story had a little bit of a darker tone. Yeah, and it still had a little bit of a darker right. tone because when when you're sitting there watching it, you quickly realize that the movie is basically a, a parable about racism. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a, a lecture about racism, and I'm like, wow, this is kind of deep for a Pixar movie. Now, and it was a little 
Are, are we sure that was Pixar? It's because it's not on my it? list of Pixar. It is. It was Disney. Oh, it was, oh, you know what? I think Disney got it. But I think what happened? That's after last they bought Pixar. But you, it had a. You could tell it had a very Pixar influence on it. I thought. So it's it's Disney, not Pixar. Yeah, it's not on my Pixar list. Yeah, it'll be it'll be the Pixar people. You can see the Pixar people being behind uh-huh. it, but it's it's not at that point. And that's another thing when Disney basically begged to buy back buy Dick buy Pixar. Steve I, Steve Jobs basically, oh, if you want us back, baby, you gotta we gotta sit on the board. I did I did see uh, Zootopia, and I, I I did like it. Yeah. So it says here it's a 2016 American animated. Buddy Cop action film produced by Walt Disney Animation Studios and released by Walt Disney Pictures. Yeah. I had assumed it was Pixar. And you you wouldn't be wrong because it has a lot of Pixar fingerprints on it. Because remember, yeah, yeah. Disney had bought Pixar a lot before then. Yeah. Yes. So there's a lot of Pixar influence in that. Sure. Interesting. Sure. All right. Learn something new. But if you haven't seen Zootopia, check it out. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, I really it's good. enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Anything else you guys want to wrap up on? Anything you're looking forward to uh, coming out from uh, Disney or anything? Uh, I have this desire to go binge watch a bunch of old, <laughs> old Pixar movies. Now. I know. I there there. I it's like comfort my, food. My number one. I I need to watch is uh, Wally. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna have to revisit Wally. It's been a long uh, time. Um, I I I I, I online uh, yesterday. I was I was looking at like. So I don't remember who it was, but they said, uh, you know, from worst to best of Pixar, and they had yeah. Wally as number one. So interesting. I figured, you know what? I haven't heard anything bad about it really, so I'd I'd like to watch. And it. tying back to one of our pre- episodes in our previous incarnation, Toy Story Two is one of those things on my top one hundred list. If it's on, I'll I'll watch it. Oh sure. If it's on, I'm like, oh, oh, I watch it thing. now. Yeah, yeah. I don't care what what point in the movie. I've at. only seen it once, and when it first came out in the theater. And that's it. So I don't really remember. So I, I definitely yeah. need to watch that again. Yeah. yeah. Toy Story 2 was just great. Yep. I will say this, since we're talking about toys. Uh, when Cars came out, um, Mattel started re- releasing die-cast versions of the characters from the movies. And I collect die-cast cars from television and film. So I started buying all the, the cars, die-cast cars. They weren't necessarily Hot Wheels, even though Mattel also makes Hot Wheels. But they did their own scale and their own line. And I found myself buying every release that came out until I had bins and bins and bins full of cars, die-cast cars. And all of a sudden, like a few years after its release, these became like gold. They got hot, hot, hot. And I couldn't sit on them any longer, and I started selling them off. And and I hope the IRS isn't listening, but I made thousands of dollars <laughs> on Pixar diecast cars. It was crazy. Joe, don't underestimate the reach of Hollywood blockbusters. And two, all that you to say was, I did well. That's the code. When you when you preface with the IRS, just say, I did well. I yeah, I made more than uh, what they sold for at retail. And uh, they you can still find them in stores. They're still releasing characters from the films. Uh, in stores and I, I didn't sell everything. I have a, a little core collection at home. As a matter of fact, you'll appreciate this, Andrew. I, uh, I have every racer that raced in the, uh, speedway of the South Dynaco 400 race or whatever, Really, uh, from mood Springs to vinyl toupee to all the characters. <laughs> there's probably, there's probably about 30 or 40 race s- cars that took part. <laughs> including I uh I kind of got a bootleg uh Apple 84 car there's a there's a little cameo in the race of a white Apple car and it has 84 on the side um <laughs> but yeah I'll have to show that to you someday it's a pretty impressive collection of awesome. every race car that took part in that race wow yeah yeah ooh, you know it, it's fitting we were talking about Pixar because it fits the name of the show Hollywood blockbusters for a while they that's all they were they were Hollywood blockbusters. everyone everyone was a was a blockbuster from yep. 95 to about easily till 20 2014 yeah. 2015 that that's a, almost a 20 year reign of just yeah. knocking them out I will say this about rat tattooey again that's another one that I only watched fairly recently and it grossed me out the the thought of rats in a kitchen preparing meals I'm like Again, I'm like, who 
came up with this but, concept. It's gross. But you know what? Uh, I, I give Ratatouille credit. If you can get my mom to watch that movie, <laughs> my mom just hates rats. She hates critters. And she was like, I don't know if I can watch this. And then she would just watch it. like, oh, that's adorable. I'm like, well, I was like, wow. Jesus, Lasseter, I guess you can even get my mom to turn around. No, I'm sitting there like Indiana Jones. Oh, rats. <laughs> Did not like that. All right, on that note, uh, we're going to wrap up this episode of Hollywood Blockbusters, our Disney Pixar uh, look back at their their uh, releases. Yes. And uh, we will be back in a couple of weeks. We haven't decided on the topic yet, but we'll come back with something I'm sure you'll love. And once again, we'll uh, leave you with this little ditty. Come to the movies Watch Charlie Chaplin and put some sunshine into your day Forget the hard times Come to the movies And try to laugh your troubles away